My guest is Annerin Venold. She is a five times track cycling world champion and has served as national team coach and manager, national selector and national administrator. As a qualified coach, she focuses on coaching cycling and jumps. She is also an American high school diploma consultant with first-hand experience with applying for a sports scholarship. Anarine, parents often wonder if their home educated children can compete in athletics on a provincial and national level. How do they go about it? Well, thank you, Anel, and thank you again for hosting me today. Um, yeah, so athletics is very dear to my heart. It's, it's uh, where my roots actually in um, sports started. And um, yeah, I must say it's, it's a wonderful sport in which to participate and, and then for our children in which to grow, you know, regardless of in which sport they eventually end up. Um, you know, some will uh, have the opportunity and the talent to, to grow into international level athletes, others not. Um, but there is definitely an opportunity for our homeschoolers in South Africa to not only compete in, in um, athletics, but also to excel. Now, uh, to start off with, um, currently, especially in the pandemic time and with schools still being restricted uh, in terms of inter-school competitions, or, although I've heard something, some rumor yesterday in Pretoria that that might soon be lifted as well, um, the way really to, to compete is uh, through a local or regional club. And, and that will be a club that is uh, registered to Athletics South Africa. Okay, so um, through the club, then you will get um, access to your provincial uh, offices of ISA. And, um, and then also through the club, you will be able to participate in the events that is currently ongoing. And uh, any athletes that have got any aspirations to earn provincials and national colors, um, this is the route that you will be able to achieve those, um, not through schools. Um, so um, all these competitions that are currently in progress are being held according to World Athletics regulations. And um, there are a set of benchmarks that have been published by ISA. And uh, you can see where you stand um, in terms of that to be selected nationally. And um, when you compete in any of these ISI sanctions, uh, sanctioned in events in South Africa and you reach a certain standard, um, ISI statistics also takes that information into the database and that is forwarded to World Athletics and you can get the World Athletics ranking as well. Now, for those that um, are interested not to go through the club route, um, you can inquire at your local school. Uh, most schools have got a, a couple of uh, private coaches that's um, operational and uh, which provide coaching in different events. Um, there are some teachers that do it as well. Um, some of the, the schools might, might allow you to participate with them in, in meets. Um, but it will really depend on the school uh, itself. You know, some might say yes, others no, and, and that is really the uh, prerogative. Okay, and, and then um, the third aspect that I've seen or venue avenue that I've seen was, um, there was in, in the past and uh, published on some of the Facebook pages, homeschool Facebook pages, um, some homeschool specific athletics events. Uh, last year, of course, there was nothing uh, in that regard, but that is something that will be more low key, um, key that you might want to consider as well. I think the homeschool one that you um, are referring to um, in the Western Cape, um, Cape Home Educators compete with yeah. the Christian private schools in an athletics event. And um, yeah, if you qualify regionally, again, provincially, and then you can also compete on a, a national level. Um, I wanted to ask you in terms of the clubs, do they cater for primary school children as well? Yes, they do, they do. Um, again, this year, because of the uh, pandemic still being around, and many of the competitions for now has been focused on um, the um, high school and senior athletes. 
Um, although some of the provinces, especially here in the Northwest, in Port of Sturm, I've been hosting a, a couple of meets uh, where um, primary schools can also participate. So yes, they, they do cater. It's really just now finding some uh, events in which you can participate as a primary school child. Um, I've seen the newest ASA teachers list have been released as well. And it's now been confirmed that the primary school SI championships will be um, later this year, I think in October um, of this year. So we will see definitely um, some events coming up for our primary school children as well. But, um, uh, you know, in my coaching group, I see the primary school children are continuing to train, you know, that they might not have the, the um, competitions now to compete in. Um, but they are still growing as athletes. Now, most parents are familiar with athletics as a sport because of their relationship with school. Um, but yeah. cycling, that is something that most schools do not offer. So if your child is a keen cyclist, what route can you go to compete again nationally, provincially, um, and possibly later internationally? Yes. Okay, no. So... As with athletics, there are various means through which your child can grow and compete. And it really just depends on um, his or her aspirations and talent level. Um, just for interest sake, uh, currently the African Continental Championships for road and track cycling is in progress. Actually, the, the road cycling has been completed over the weekend and South Africa um, is doing quite well or did quite well and we hope that we'll do well in track cycling as well but um, interesting enough they, there's a couple of homeschoolers or ex-homeschoolers who um, is wearing the green and gold with pride so it's definitely a, a sport that is open to homeschooling um, because of its nature now if you want to grow your talents and pursue provincial and national level um cycling as a homeschooler you know there, there's uh, various things that you need to consider and, and I just want to touch on a couple of those um, you know first of all is there's a um, you need to explore the different types of disciplines cycling disciplines that are available um, I don't know if everybody knows I'm, I'm just going to list those that are available in South Africa for um, our cyclists and those include road cycling, um, our track cycling, BMX and mountain biking. Um, and in each of these cycling different um, disciplines, um, there are different events. Uh, and specifically the track cycling is the most diverse We on um, the Olympic level, which we will see hopefully later this year, there are um, five events for the men and five events for the women. Um, and then on cross route level, there are even more. Now, so first of all, then just to summarize, to explore <laughs> what you want to do and you know, get a feel for, for what, what is um, available. And, and, and because some of the disciplines um, may suit you more than others. And then um, it's really uh, by increasing your quantity and quality of training. Um, the, the, the nature thereof will depend on um, your chosen uh, event and discipline of cycling and then the specific event demands. And then again, you will hear as with athletics, it's uh, the club system um, through which you work, have to work. And if you are looking at the club, you know, it's really um, this various avenues. You can, again, look on the Cycling SA webpage uh, to find a club or go to a local cycling uh, um, shop or ask fellow cyclists. Um, and uh, yeah, through the, the cycling clubs, you will then um, get more information of uh, local races. Again, currently those are very scarce. It's uh, mostly pursued on, on provincial and SA level, the, the riding that um, will be taking place, hopefully to be expanded more. And then um, a cycling club at your local school um, is, is another opportunity uh, or avenue, um, especially uh, in um, the north. Um, with the school's per mountain bike series and um, that has been 
started a, a couple of years back and has been well established. Cycling has really become a, a school sport and, and can also be pursued through this means. Similar to athletics, you know, uh, you can approach your local school um, and yeah, if they will allow your child to participate with them. Um, yeah, and I, I think then speaking as a coach, you know, then uh, a, a fourth way to improve is to find and, and work with a reliable and certified coach who can guide and monitor your growth. You know, as, as um, in, in this day and age where information is freely available, you can find uh, programs on, on the web, you know, that's, that's not a problem, but um, it is about um, individuality of the athlete. You know, that's not necessarily considered sufficiently, if at all, and through those programs, and through a coach, you um, will be able to structure your training program better, not only looking at your physiological aspects of training, but also the psychological and technical and tactical aspects thereof. And then uh, maybe just lastly to reiterate, to be able to compete at, on a provincial level, um, you should be uh, part of a club and then you should hold a cycling SA membership. Again, details of that is available on the Cycling SA webpage. And, and then to be able to compete internationally for South Africa, um, you as a rider should have met and exceeded the relevant Cycling South Africa selection criteria. And for each of the disciplines that I've mentioned up front, um, it is different. And in many cases, it even differs um, between the different events that, um, that the Team South Africa is aiming towards. Um, again, a question about the primary school children. Um, I know there are many uh, fun events where younger children can also enter um, shorter distances, um, but for example, track cycling um, and competitive road cycling, is it more aimed at high school and adults or is there uh, competitive cycling for primary school children? Um, I, I would say more to the high school level, you know, um, uh, for, for some of the events. So let me backtrack. For BMX, they start at the age of four. <laughs> so you can, you can do that competitively from very, very early on. Um, I'm coaching a, a, one of our up and coming lady cyclists in South Africa who um, went overseas as a primary school athletes and to compete in world championships from a young age. Um, so it is possible, it depends on, on the discipline. And mountain biking, again, you know, many of the events are more that that's being hosted by the organizers are more aimed at, at um, um, your more mature cyclists and, and, and that will include your high school and upwards. Um, but it's not necessarily a, a, a something that is, I think, wrong with the system. Although, you know, we, I'm, I'm very passionate about um, bringing in more skill development training for primary schools. So it's not so much about the competition, but by building the skills and the techniques that you need um, to be able to, um, uh, to ride well when you are older. So just answering your question, yes, there are um, uh, not, not so many events for the primary school children as for uh, your older students. Um, but I actually think it's a good thing <laughs> because it allows opportunity to, to build the skills. Cycling, as with any other sport, um, it builds great life skills as well, because as you said, there's, there's a mental aspect to it as well as a physical, um, yeah, and being able to pursue and, you know, persevere. Um, yes. Yeah, but it's a journey that you know very well. Um, now, you have a, a very accomplished child as well, and you are currently busy with the USA recruitment process for your son, um, and he has achieved early NCAA academic qualifier status, and is currently considering university offers. So, what is the process in applying for a sports scholarship? Yeah, it's been quite a journey over the last two years already for us, when uh, yeah, we kicked off with the recruitment process and considered the various avenues. Um, you know, so a statement that I've, I've heard previously is, is that this 
the U.S. universities, you must go there. There's um, so many uh, sports scholarships that are on offer. Um, and, um, you know, it's true, you know, the U.S. university, they do offer uh, sports scholarships as they offer academic scholarships to attract uh, talented youngsters. Um, but maybe just to share some statistics before I, I, I delve into, um, into the process itself. <laughs> um, you know, to, to obtain a sports scholarship at the U.S., I think, uh, um, locally, you know, uh, we are now touching on the U.S. environment, but um, some of it is also true here with us. It is extremely rare, um, as it is a very, very competitive environment. Um, the NCAA, to whom you refer earlier on, which is one of the U.S. collegiate sport governing bodies, um, released some stats last year in August, uh, where they stated that only about 7% of high school athletes across all sports receive the opportunity to continue with their sports um, on university level. Now, um, that equates to an odd half million athletes who are then given the opportunity to play in the 24 uh, sports offered by the NCAA on university level. Now, of these <laughs> Half million athletes, less than 2% of student athletes are offered any form of sports scholarship. So we are not talking about the full scholarship here, but any form of scholarship. So it's really, you know, just to get recruited um, in the US, not, notwithstanding receiving any financial aid or assistance um, is already a great achievement and, and blessing. And uh, yeah, so I just want to kick off with that. Um, the, the, the recruitment process itself, and I will get to the detail in a while, um, is quite foreign and, and complex. And, and, and uh, the process through which I learned was to, to stay in contact with experts on that um, and to learn uh, with the American families because it's, it's foreign for us, but it's foreign for many of their families as, as well. Yeah, so this combination of a, a complex recruiting process and then the low uh, possibility of actually being uh, to be recruited, um, they, you know, the question might arise, why would you like to go for, um, for this opportunity and um, with all the odds being against you? Um, but there are a couple of clear benefits which I would like to highlight and, and, and stress why we are also still considering this as an option for our son. And um, first of all is, is that as a student or student athlete, you will be able to pursue your sport and academics concurrently. Um, they, the universities offer top-notch academic support um, by having student athletics specific academic advisors. Um, your coach will actually be accountable in terms of your academic um, status. So um, I've, I've heard of many cases um, where students underperformed academically and then they, will, they were put on the bench um, until that has been sorted out. Um, so that is different than what we've had, we've got in South Africa, we, um, the professors will just accept that you will be able to balance the two, uh, we, as there's real assistance to, to which the student athletes to, to create a balance. And um, interestingly enough, on, on this point, the NCAA um, will track the academic stats of their membership colleges and universities. I've um, also uh, released that the grad graduation rate of your student athletes are typically higher than their peers in the general student body. And, and, and I think it's really because the, the additional support um, is offered by the sport department. Then um, what you also will receive is quality medical care and sport medicine support. Um, that includes dietitians, um, chiropractors, uh, physios, um, we and we need it. And then, um, of course, access to quality coaching facilities and equipment. So it's not that we don't have 
excellent coaches in South Africa. You know, we, we've got some of the best and, and you can see it from how well our athletes are doing um, in, in many instances. Um, but there's just, a, a, I think, um, a better support specifically from an academic um, perspective for our um, student athletes. Um, Anala, if you would just allow me, uh, before we go into the process itself, also just to discuss quickly um, the American Collegiate Sport and require, um, Recruitment System. Um, it's necessary that we just look at the different bodies because the different uh, governance bodies have got different requirements. And, and I won't go into that detail today, but it's, it's just necessary to know that there are a couple of bodies. Um, there is first of all the NCAA, which is on the top tier, and then also NAIA and uh, JUCO. Um, and their requirements and um, timelines will differ. And um, within these, uh, there are also different divisions. Now, I'm just quickly going to touch on the NCAA, uh, which is the top tier one, where they've got three divisions. And um, the first division consists of nearly 350 colleges and universities. And this is really your most competitive sporting governing body um, and, and division. <laughs> And that is available and usually, you know, they um, manage the largest um, athletics budgets and um, offer the most generous number of scholarships, but it is typically the most difficult to get into as well because of those reasons. Um, the Division 1, the eligibility standards are also the highest, so to get into uh, the division uh, takes a higher academic standard. Then Division Two, which consists of uh, more than 300 colleges, and again, it's a high level of um, sports standard, and um, but there's a bit more flexibility um, in terms of time for for the student athlete to pursue other interests apart from sport and academics. And then the last one um, is the Division Three, which is the NCAA's large, largest um, division. And um, there's around about 200,000 students uh, from more than 400 institutions. Now, um, worthwhile well to know is that this division does not offer any sports scholarships, um, but they do offer you still the opportunity to continue with sport while in college. And, and many athletes um, have, uh, because of the academic scholarships offered here, you know, it, for some athletes, it makes more sense to, to go to the division three than to one and two, if you look at the financial side of things. And then something else to uh, consider is that for you to be able to, to play sport uh, in the US at a US university or college, you must be declared eligible to do that. Um, now, again, the different governance bodies have got different requirement, the requirements, um, and with the NCAA being the strictest, um, I just want to highlight um, two aspects on which I focus. First of all is your academic performance during high school. Um, that is, um, that they've got a, um, set requirements in, in terms of the number of subjects or certain subjects that you must have in place and um, your GPA score and balancing that with your SAT score. So academic performance. And then secondly, you must be an amateur um, athlete. So you may not have received any um, scholarships whilst at high school to be able to, to play, um, uh, to be declared eligible for the NCAA. Oh, yeah, there's a third one that I wanted to, to highlight, although this is not a necessity, it would certainly work in your, to your advantage if you um, work through a school or, or an academy during your high school years at least, which have got a good NCAA standing or offer NCAA um, approved courses, um, because this will just help you to ensure that when you as a homeschooler submit your uh, material to the NCIA for approval and that everything is right and that you don't end up being 
um, not eligible to play because of the, the academic work that you have done through high school. You'll probably touch on it, but I'm just thinking it's wonderful to hear that they balance academics and sport. Um, yes. So you can't um, just rely on your, your sport ability. Um, yes. But I want to know, how do they measure your sport ability? Do they have set requirements in each discipline again? Um, yeah, how do you qualify for that? Because it's easy to understand in terms of your SAT score, but yeah. yeah. So you're talking about the sport and um, qualifying from a sport perspective. Yes. Yes. Um, and now it's, it's interesting, you know, it, it, it depends so much on, on the sport that you do. Some of the sports are easier to quantify, um, like the, the track and field and swimming where you, you've got a time or a height or a distance. Um, so the NCAA in itself doesn't have requirements, but the different schools might have got um, requirements. So typically the schools will have a requirement we um, they say, you know, this is the walk on standard. So meaning uh, with um, a set time or distance, uh, you would be able to uh, be part of the team. And then they've got also um, and in some cases, uh, cases, partial and full scholarship requirements. And it's, you know, so if you meet those, um, then you uh, are not guaranteed, but at least then you know you're in the ballpark to be considered for that particular um, university or college. Uh, for your team sports, um, they really look at videos, you know, um, and um, how you manage yourself um, within a team setup, within uh, in, in, within a competition, you know, and with sports now being cancelled across the world uh, for quite some time, especially in the team sports. I've seen various families which are getting agitated because their children do not have footage of um, uh, recent games. But, you know, that is that is something that the college coaches have got to deal with is, um, um, is that they need to work with what they've got. Um, and they do take into consideration, you know, the restrictions that the pandemic has placed on performance for our athletes. Um, but in the end, you know, money talks and, and they, <laughs> they will, will look at um, recruiting the best uh, for the less amount of, of uh, funding from their side. And now just to get to the recruitment process in itself, and um, in a sense, we touch on this now was that um, your student athlete must really be marketable um, to, to get in or foot into the door. So that means that he or she needs to work hard, not only at, at the sport in which they wish to continue, but um, then also in academics and the general portfolio and um, that they want to stand out in. You know, this includes taking on and excelling in extramural activities such as leadership roles and volunteer work. Um, yes, so it's really building a portfolio, a strong portfolio. Um, in, in terms of, uh, you, you had a question in terms of uh, if, as an international student, you would also be able to apply for um, or to the universities and for NCAA eligibility with your CAPS and or IEB or any other high school certificate and diploma. And um, the question is yes, the NCAA does make provision for that. And they've got a whole section um, on their webpage dealing with um, international athletes. So you would be able to look at that. Um, but typically it will require not only finalizing your high school, but then also supplementing that with either the SAT or ACT. So that's the first step. The second one is to create a, a social media platform where you can share videos of your best performances or progress. You know, that, that uh, you, you might have to establish a YouTube channel or um, either through Facebook or Instagram, um, share information and, and make that information available to the coaches. And then the third point is 
to determine where you want to study. Now, now with more than 4,500 colleges and universities um, in the US, this, this in itself can be daunting, um, but it is very achievable. Um, and you know, this is maybe a talk for <laughs> an opportunity to talk about this some more at the later stage, um, Anel, where we can unpack it further. But as a student athlete, you really need to choose your university and college extra carefully. Um, because, of course, you want to go where you will have um, a good fit. You know, um, you, you might not be um, the top tier of, of athletes, and, and that will eliminate some universities. Or you might not be the top tier academics, and that will eliminate some universities. But uh, with so many universities and colleges on offer, there is a good fit, and it's it's just finding those. Um, with well noticing here yeah, as well is is that the Ivy schools uh, does not offer um, any sports scholarships. So I'm talking about the Harvard, Yale's, Dartmouths of the, of the world. Now, as soon as you've established these universities. Um, it is highly recommended that you contact at least 20 to 30 of these across the different sporting bodies. Okay, so not putting all your eggs in one basket, not focusing um, only on D1s, um, NCAA D1s, um, but um, look at D1s, D2s, D, D, um, D3s. And uh, is, um, you know, th this is something that's foreign to us because usually you will just apply to one, maybe two universities in South Africa and you will go there. Um, whereas this is really throwing um, or contacting much wider. And um, then based on the response, you might want to contact even um, further universities. Um, you know, the response rate of the coaches uh, depends, <laughs> but you would really be fortunate if you receive feedback from um, a third of, of these. A fifth point to consider is then um, making contact with the college coaches. I've mentioned it uh, a couple of times. So how you do that is to go to the college's webpage or the university's webpage. You will specifically go to their uh, sport page, athletics page. And um, in there, you will find sports specific recruitment um, questionnaires. So if um, like in our case, you are in track and field, then you go to track and field um, fields section and you will um, search there for the recruitment questionnaire. And um, you need to fill that out and follow that up with the introductory email to the particular coach. So yes, it's a lot of paperwork, <laughs> but uh, if it can pay for your uh, college, it's really worthwhile. Now, in terms of timeline of establishing that contact, um, it is important that you take note of, of the requirements of the collegiate governance body. Um, usually that's also dependent on the sport that you want to play. Now, for instance, again, track and field, uh, we were allowed to make contact with the, the coaches, but they were only allowed to start responding to us um, after Edrix's grade 10 uh, year. Okay, so again, it depends on your sport, but if you don't hear back from them, it might be that you're just early in the process and that they are not allowed to respond back to you. Now, as soon as they are allowed to um, respond back to you, um, the form of communication will typically be um, through um, emails. Um, a few might um, provide them with your uh, with their WhatsApp details, and you you can chat that way, or sharing Instagram accounts, or they will subscribe to your YouTube channel. Um, yeah, so this um, we, we've had, and Idrik has had uh, various phone calls with um, the universities as, as well, where they will have an hour uh, or more discussion with um, the student in, in terms of getting to know the student more. Because the whole recruitment process, guys, is really about building a relationship. You know, they, in the end, will get a student with whom they will work for four years and and they need to make sure 
that apart from you being um, having the ability uh, on an academic and sport level, you, you also will be a good fit within their program. Now, if you've not done it yet, another thing that you need to do is you need to register a, an NCII account, if that is a governance boarding that you will work uh, through. Um, the initial one, you do not have to pay for that, but later on um, to get um, the eligibility signed off, there is some cost involved, but that site in itself, there's a wealth of information that are available. In the process itself, you know, as I mentioned, it, it's really about building a, a, building a relationship. Now, it doesn't mean that you, you will be talking to them daily. You know, um, they do have a job as well. They are talking to their team and they are talking to new recruits. And, um, but it is... Um, courtesy to at least once a month, just give them feedback in terms of where you are, um, any new um, aspect that you want to share, uh, an accomplishment on sport or an academic level, you might do, want to share with them. Um, but yes, it's, that is then a continuous process that you follow up to the point where you arrive, where an offer is being made or you decide to, to um, to, to move away from, from a particular college. Part of this process is, is then for you, you just need to stay abreast of what the NCAA requirements are, as I've mentioned before, but specifically the calendar, and then specifically also the university admission requirements and deadlines, because just something that I need to mention is that um, a university can make a, a offer to you you know it can be either verbally or um, on paper um, but that does not guarantee that you will be accepted by the university um, in some universities um, for sure it opens doors for you to um, to work through the uh, through the sports department um, but for others, and um, it's it's uh, much more restrictive in terms of, of what the um, admission requirements are. So in the end, those two um, are separate. Um, and yes, then eventually when you receive an offer from a college, they usually have got a, a timeline within which you need to respond. And if you accept the offer, you will be typically required to sign a contract. Again, it depends on the governing body and division that you work through. Uh, with the NCIA, they call this a, na a national letter of intent. And you might have seen pictures on, on the web page where the child will sit with all the banners and signing the contracts. And uh, yeah, so in a nutshell, that is the process. Um, Anel, any questions? Not one that I can think of at the moment, but I, I do think that it prepares you also for your life as a professional athlete, because these days professional athletes are so much in the spotlight and they have to market themselves and, and put themselves out there that if you can practice doing that while you're still at home, um, yeah. It, yeah, I think you are actually um, well prepared for your adult life and your professional career. Yes, no, for sure. And, you know, I must really um, say that although there's a lot of uncertainty within this recruitment process and you don't know what to expect uh, by when and, um, you know, if you get, get an offer, you don't know if you want, will want to go there because you have not visited the site uh, or the, the campus and et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, the coaches um, are really pleasant people and they are really um, building up the students um, tremendously. You know, of course, they are selling um, their campus and their um, department uh, uh, and their squad to you as well. But it's it's really people who are interested in in the students, and and uh, you know um, that is that is great. As as you mentioned, you know, it's a it's a process. You know, even if you go through the process and you still decide, no, I'm you know, I'm not going to take up any offers or no, I'm not going to go overseas. Um, it's a, a, a process through which um, I've seen Edric grow uh, 
because he had to, you know, he had to <laughs> sell himself, market himself. Um, yeah, he, he had to sit through interviews um, on Zoom uh, or telephone discussions. Um, and uh, yeah, so it's, it's a great opportunity uh, for growth. And um, yeah, maybe just lastly from my side, you know, I think our talented sportsmen and women mm -hmm. and um, in South Africa, really, there, there's so many opportunities um, that are available both, both locally and internationally to, to pursue. So we, we are in a good situation. Anarine, thank you very much for all the information. And um, I wish you the best of luck with Edric's um, choices and <laughs> decisions you have to make. Um, yeah, and I think we will have a follow up conversation because there is still so much to um, explore and for parents in South Africa to understand as well.